I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 13th chapter of Schultz & Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about psychoanalysis, the beginnings, which is basically about Sigmund Freud and his theories. Now, the chapter begins with a vignette about a dream of Freud's from when he was a child that included bird-like figures with long beaks. Now, as an adult, he realized that a slang term for sex in German was derived from the term for bird. Coincidence? Of course not. This is Freud. Now, Sigmund Freud creates a new school of thought, and he changed the way people thought about themselves. He thought that Copernicus, Darwin, and himself uh, had delivered shocks to humanity. Copernicus showed that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Darwin showed that humans were not a unique and privileged species. And Freud showed that we're not the rulers of our lives, but are under the influence of unconscious forces of which we are unaware and over which we have little or no control. Now, psychoanalysis is not the product of universities or pure science. It came out of medicine and uh, psychiatry, which is why it's a new school of thought. So it's not directly comparable to the other schools that we've studied thus far. Its subject matter was psychopathology or abnormal behavior. Its primary method is clinical observation, not experimentation. And it deals with the unconscious, which is a topic ignored by other schools. Now, the reason why is for people like Wundt and Titchener, the unconscious had no place in psychology because it couldn't be studied through introspection. The functionalists only studied consciousness and the behaviorists didn't think that consciousness was something to study, much less the unconscious. Well, what are the antecedent influences? And these basically are about the unconscious, treating mental disorders and evolutionary theory. Let's start with Gottfried Leibniz, who comes up with this idea of monadology, which is psychic entities similar to perceptions. Uh, and when you're conscious of them, they can be described as apperceptions. Johann Herbert builds on this, and he says that there's conflict among ideas struggling for conscious realization. And inhibited ideas exist below the level of consciousness. Fechner, who we've talked about earlier, also talks about this idea of a threshold of conscious awareness and uses an iceberg analogy, which Freud later used too. By the 1870s, books used the word unconscious in their titles. So Freud didn't invent the concept. And um, yeah, so it was there before him. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle thought that mental illness came from disordered thought, and they prescribed the persuasive healing power of words for it. Now, by the 18th century, mental illness was seen as irrational behavior, and people were confined to institutions similar to jails. Along comes Philippe Pinel, and he thought that mental illness was treatable by the methods of natural science. He released patients from their chains and treated them decently and listened to their complaints. An American reformer is Dorothea Dix, and she's pictured there. And they were called insane asylums at the time, and she was a ref the American reformer of those. She was a deeply religious person who uh, suffered from depression herself. Now, the first American psychiatrist was Benjamin Rush, and he thought that patients were sick, not possessed. He's also a signer, excuse me, <clears throat> of the Declaration of Independence. Now, he thought that some irrational behaviors were caused by too much or too little blood. And so he drained blood from his patients or pumped more blood into them. Another antecedent influence is the Emanuel movement. And this was the Emanuel Church healing movement. And it relied on the power of suggestion by the moral authority of the clergy. Basically, it was talk therapy sessions with ministers. It was very popular with the public, but the medical community opposed ministers as therapists. Well, let's talk about hypnosis. And this, it's really, it's Mesmer who comes up with this idea of animal magnetism, and he uses it to restore equilibrium. So the idea was that you could cure nervous disorders 
by restoring the equilibrium between a patient's magnetic levels and the levels in their environment. Now, Mesmer was considered to be a quack in Vienna, but he was a big hit in Paris until an investigating commission shut him down, and then he moved to Switzerland, where he lived with his bird. Charcot described the symptoms of hysteria and the use of hypnosis in medical terminology, which made it much more acceptable. And that's Charcot in the picture, and we'll revisit him later because Freud goes to study with him. Now, Darwin focused, focused on the non-rational aspects of thought and behavior, and Freud thought that the study of Darwin was essential for psychoanalysis. Darwin discusses things like unconscious mental processes and conflicts, the significance of dreams, the hidden symbolism of certain behaviors, and the importance of sexual arousal. Now, to finish out, Vienna was considered a permissive society at the time, and it's not as prudish and inhibited as we would think. Viennese doctors were writing about childhood sexuality and libido before Freud. Catharsis was also a popular treatment, and dreams were being analyzed. So all of these were an influence on Freud, but he was able to draw them together into a consistent and coherent system. Well, who was Sigmund Freud? Well, he's born in Freiburg, but moves to Vienna at the age of four. His father was a wool merchant and 20 years older than Freud's mother, who was his third wife. His father was strict and authoritarian, and Freud feared and loved him. And you can see that's Freud as a boy uh, pictured with his father. Freud's mother was protective and loving, and he felt a passionate attachment to her. She called him, quote, my golden Siggy, and that's how I always think of him, too. He was precociously smart, and he graduated with distinction from high school at 17. He spoke German and Hebrew at home and was taught Latin, Greek, French, and English in school. And then he also taught himself Italian and Spanish. He began medical school in 1873 at the University of Vienna, and he took eight years to get his degree. He didn't want to be a practicing physician, but a medical researcher. And at one time, he dissected 400 male eels to determine their testicular structure. Now, he experimented with cocaine. Um, you might say, some people say they experiment with drugs. Freud was into full-scale research with cocaine. He was a big advocate of cocaine, but then he wasn't. And uh, he switched over to wine by 1896. He married Martha Bernays, who may or may not have been saucy. That's a very bad pun, I apologize, because Bernays sauce. They had a four-year engagement during which Freud was very possessive of her, and they eventually had six children, although Freud took his vacations alone or with his sister-in-law, Minna, who we'll revisit here in a little bit, too. Well, Joseph, let's talk about the case of Anna O., Joseph Brewer had befriended Freud. Now, Brewer was a prominent physician who offered Freud advice, lent him money, and viewed him as a precocious younger brother. They often discussed Brewer's patients. And a very famous one is Anna O. Now, her real name was Bertha Pappenheim, and she suffered from hysterical complaints that included paralysis, memory loss, mental deterioration, nausea, and disturbances of vision and speech. Brewer used hypnosis with her, and he realized that talking about specific experiences under hypnosis relieved her of symptoms. She called it chimney sweeping or the talking cure. Brewer also found that Anna was transferring the love that she felt for her father to him. And this is what's called positive transference. And it's when a patient responds to the therapist as if they were a significant person, such as a parent, in the patient's life. Brewer saw this transference as a threat, though, and cut off contact with her. That caused Anna to go into hysterical childbirth, which Brewer helped with hypnosis. He also got her addicted to morphine. Now, Anna O was not cured by Brewer, uh, and she was institutionalized. Uh, she eventually recovered and became a social worker and feminist. She died in 1936 after an interrogation regarding an anti-Nazi comment that she had supposedly made. 
Well, in 1885, Freud gets a grant to go to Paris and to study with Charcot, who we talked about earlier. Oh, at a, at a party, excuse me, at a party, Freud overhears Charcot say, in this sort of case, it's always a case of the genitals. Always, always, always. Toujours, toujours, toujours. And Charcot alters Freud's view of the role of sex in hysterical behavior because of this comment. Freud later wrote, I was almost paralyzed with amazement and said to myself, well, if he knows that, why does he never say so? Freud returned to Vienna and abandoned hypnosis. He found that he was rarely able to achieve a long-term cure with it. He retained catharsis and developed the technique of free association, where a patient says whatever comes to mind, no matter how embarrassing, unimportant, or foolish it might seem. Freud finds nothing random in the free associations and found that they often revealed childhood sexual issues. In 1895, with Brewer, he publishes Studies on Hysteria, and that's usually used as the, uh, or considered to be the formal beginning of psychoanalysis. Now, Brewer was his co-author, and he was reluctant to publish because he didn't agree with Freud that sex was the sole cause of neurotic behavior. Freud was certain, though, and he wanted to publish before someone else could publish before him and claim priority. Well, in 1896, Freud presents a paper to the Viennese Society of Psychiatry and Neurology. Uh, and he says that while using free association, patients reveal childhood seductions and that it was often the father who did the seduction and that this was the cause of neurosis. The society's president said that it sounded like, quote, a scientific fairy tale. Freud said that his critics were asses and could go to hell. A year later, though, Freud reversed his position. He said that the seductions were not real, but they were quite real to his patients. So sex remained the root of the problem, and that's how Freud preserved the idea of sex as the cause of neurosis. Now, you might ask yourself, what about Freud's own sex life, which actually starts at 30 and is over at 41? Well, Freud himself had a negative attitude towards sex and experienced personal sexual difficulties. Isn't this terrible to be talking about, though? Freud found the sex act to be degrading and, at age 41, gave up having sex with his wife. However, his sister-in-law, Minna, came to live with the family that same year and stayed with them for the next 43 years. So, Freud was a virgin until his marriage at 30, and then was done with sex 11 years and six children later. What about Freud's own neuroses? Well, he had a major neurotic episode the year he gave up sex. He had migraine headaches, urinary problems, a spastic colon, and worried about dying, feared for his heart, and became anxious about travel and open spaces. And you can see him, actually he's pictured there with his wife. Freud decided to psychoanalyze himself by studying his dreams. Now, Freud realized that he couldn't analyze himself through something like free association because he couldn't be both the patient and the therapist at the same time. So that's why he decided to analyze his dreams. Freud believes that dreams result from conflict in the unconscious mind. So on waking, Freud conducted dream analysis and then free associated uh, about his dreams. He realized from this free association that he had considerable hostility towards his father. And Freud's self-analysis resulted in the publication of his major work, The Interpretation of Dreams in 1900, in which he outlines the idea of the Oedipus complex. This book has a real impact because Carl Jung reads it in Zurich and becomes a convert to psychoanalysis. And dream analysis also becomes a standard part of the psychoanalytic technique. Freud reaches the pinnacle of success between 1900 and 1910. In 1901, he publishes The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, where he talks about the idea of the Freudian slip, or it's also called a malapropism. This is an act of forgetting or a lapse in speech that reflects unconscious motives or anxieties. 
In German, it means a blunder or faulty performance. And I'll give you an example, an embarrassing example from my own life. When I was a young faculty member at one of my first jobs, I didn't have the syllabus printed up on the first day because I couldn't print it up. I didn't have a way to print it. And so I was a little nervous anyway. And I stood in front of the class and I said, I don't have your syllabus because my hooker isn't printed up yet. Now, everyone was shocked and then started laughing uh, because I meant to say that my printer wasn't hooked up yet. I had to teach the next hour and I was like, I was, don't say hooker, don't say hooker. And I got up and I said in the next class, I don't have your syllabus because my hooker isn't printed up yet. I made the same Freudian slip twice within two hours. By 1902, he starts a weekly dis discussion group on psychoanalysis. And the topic of the first meeting was the psychology of cigar making. But early attendees included, included Alfred Adler and Carl Jung, who we'll talk more about in chapter 14, both of them. Uh, Freud's daughter, Anna, who we'll also talk about in chapter 14, called the people who came the odd ones, the dreamers, and those who knew neurotic suffering from their own experience. In 1905, he publishes three essays on the theory of sexuality. And it was during this time, again, between 1900 and 1910, that Freud became so well known and sought after that he could charge $25 an hour for therapy sessions. Freud comes to America in 1909 to Clark University. We talked about this earlier too. G. Stanley Hall invited him to deliver lectures and awarded him an honorary doctorate in psychology. He also got to meet the prominent American psychologists of that time. Now, Freud did not like the United States. Uh, he didn't like the food, the lack of public toilets, and the informal manners that people had. He said, America is a mistake, a gigantic mistake. Uh, to be fair, though, he didn't like Vienna either, and he had lived there for over 80 years. Freud breaks with Adler in 1911 and Jung in 1914. Now, in the picture there, that's G. Stanley Hall, front row center, and then Freud is off to the left and Carl Jung is off to the right. Now, about this break, Freud would just not tolerate people who disagreed with him about psychoanalysis. He just wouldn't stand it. In 1923, Freud is diagnosed with mouth cancer. Now, he had 33 operations over the next 16 years and had parts of his palate and upper jaw removed. However, he continued to see uh, patients and smoked 20 cigars per day. The Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933 and they would burn Freud's books. Now Freud said, what progress we're making. In the Middle Ages, they would have burnt me. Nowadays, they're content with burning my books. Now that was in Germany. Freud lived in Austria. But in 1938, German troops were welcomed into Austria uh, during what was called the Anschluss. And his daughter, Anna, was arrested and detained by the Nazis. And that's what finally persuaded Freud to leave Vienna. Through the intervention of the United States, the Nazis allowed Freud to move to England. And it should be pointed out that four of Freud's sisters died in the Holocaust. Freud was welcomed in England and the Freud Museum is now there outside of London. And you can go to his, also you can go to his original home in Vienna on the Burgerstrasse, I've been to both. Uh, and it's now a museum, actually they're both museums, but the London Museum has his original couch. Freud dies in 1939 of a fatal overdose of morphine from his doctor, although which doctor administered it is subject to some controversy. Well, what were his methods of treatment? Well, free association methods sometimes hit resistances. These are memories that are too shameful to shameful to be faced in conscious awareness. But the presence of resistances showed that the analyst should continue to probe that area. Also, the discovery of resistances leads to the principle of repression, which is ejecting from consciousness any unacceptable ideas, memories, and desires so that they operate in the unconscious. He said that repression was, quote, the cornerstone on which the whole structure of psychoanalysis rests. He also does dream analysis. And this is about the manifest and latent content of dreams. Now, 
the manifest content is the storyline of the dream, what the dream is seems to be about, what you might tell your friends about the next day. Whereas the latent content is the true significance or meaning of the dream. Now, Freud believed that many occurrences in dreams, like flying or falling, were universal, that all people experienced them. But he also said that not all dreams were meaningful. In therapy, Freud put his chair at the head of the psychoanalytic couch because he said that he couldn't stand being, or he couldn't put up with being stared at by other people for eight hours a day. Now, Freud sometimes fell asleep during the sessions, and he also had a chow dog named Joffy who was often there during therapy sessions, and he would talk to Joffy um, also. And actually, here's there's a picture of Joffy with Freud. Now, in terms of personality, well, really in terms of all of this, Freud uses no experimental research methods. He depends completely on his own ideas. Now, Freud believes that instincts are the motivating forces of personality, and he comes up with the life instinct and then later the death instinct. The life instinct is all about self-preservation and survival. It's the creative forces which sustain life and the form of energy through which the life instincts are manifested is called the libido. Now, the death, the death instinct is destructive forces or aggression. And as Freud grew older, he became convinced that aggression could be as powerful a motivator as sex. Neo-Freudians came up with the term thanatos, but Freud never actually used that term himself. There's three levels to personality, the id, the ego, and the superego. And hopefully this isn't the first time you've heard of these and we'll go over them more in the next slide, but they relate to Freud's iceberg analogy uh, for the relationship between consciousness and unconsciousness, where consciousness is a small and insignificant part of our entire psychic energy. The id, the ego, and the superego. Well, the id is the most primitive and least accessible part of our personality. It operates on the pleasure principle, and which is the seek pleasure and avoid pain. The id contains our basic psychic energy, which is libido, and is expressed through the reduction of tension. The ego is a mediator between the id, the superego, and the world, and it operates on the reality principle. Its job is to hold off the id's pleasure-seeking demands until an appropriate object can be found to satisfy the need and thus reduce the tension. Freud said that the interaction of the ego and the id was like the rider and a horse, a horse and a rider. Uh, the horse provides the power, but the rider is the person who directs it. The superego develops from internalizing parental and societal values and standards. It's very perfectionistic and it inhibits the id. Now, Freud says that anxiety comes in three flavors, objective, neurotic, and moral. Objective anxiety comes from actual dangers in the real world, so things like spiders and snakes. Neurotic anxiety comes from recognizing the potential dangers inherent in gratifying the id. So it's a fear of being punished for expressing impulsive desires. Moral anxiety comes from performing some act like cheating on a test that's contrary to our conscience's moral values. So you might experience guilt or shame. Now, the ego develops defense mechanisms to lower the tension caused by anxieties. And what they do essentially, these defense mechanisms, is they distort reality. So for example, if you do cheat on a test, you might use the defense mechanism of rationalization to tell yourself that you had to cheat because the test was unfair. If the test was fair, you wouldn't have cheated. It's a rationalization. Freud believes that adult personality is formed by the age of five and that people pass through a series of psychosexual stages. During this time, children are considered to be autoerotic, where they each developmental stage centers on a specific erogenous zone. So in the oral stage, which is from birth to two, pleasure comes from stimulation of the mouth and inadequate satisfaction, meaning too much or too little, can lead to an oral personality and maybe excessive optimism or sarcasm and cynicism. Um, that's food for thought. Uh, and it's also maybe where we get the term biting sarcasm, but I don't think so.
The anal stage coincides with toilet training and issues there can lead to, to an adult who's either dirty uh, and concer or concerned with being orderly and neat. The phallic stage occurs around age four and involves sexual fantasies and desires of a boy for his mother that Freud called the Oedipal complex. Usually children overcome the Oedipal complex by identifying with the parent of the same sex, which allows them to adopt the parent's superego standards. At from ages five to 12 is the latency period. And this is when sexual impulses are repressed and people form same-sex friendships. You maybe remember when you're in kindergarten, uh, people of the opposite sex oftentimes seem to have cooties or you're not supposed to be around them. The genital stage occurs during puberty and for Freud, this is when people prepare for marriage and parenthood. Now, Freud believes that all mental events, including dreams, were predetermined and nothing occurs by chance or by free will. Because psychoanalysis developed outside of academic psychology, it stayed there for years and years. Uh, an editorial in 1924 issue of the Journal of Abnormal Psychology dismissed Freud's writing as worthless. Watson called it voodooism, he's referring to psychoanalysis, and Cattell, Cattell said that Freud was a man who, quote, lives in the fairyland of dreams among the ogres of perverted sex. By the 1930s, though, psychoanalysis had captured the public's attention because it was seen as being about sex, violence, and hidden motivations. But academic psychologists were upset because people confused psychoanalysis with psychology, assuming that they were the same thing. In my experience, and maybe in yours, this is still often true. If I tell people I'm a psychologist, they say, oh, you're gonna psychoanalyze me? And I say, I'm not that kind of psychologist. In the 1950s, behaviorists translated Freud's terminology into behavior. So Skinner recast the Freudian defense mechanisms in the language of operant conditioning. And eventually psychology incorporated many Freudian concepts, such as the role of the unconscious, the importance of childhood experiences, and the operation of defense mechanisms. What about scientific validation? Well, studies have shown some support for oral and anal personality types, castration anxiety, dreams reflecting emotional concerns, and aspects of the Oedipal complex in boys in that, that there's a rivalry with the father and sexual fantasies about the mother. There's also some support for the defense mechanisms of repression, denial, identification, projection, and displacement. Studies have shown no support for dream satisfying repressed desires, boys resolving Oedipal complexes by identifying with their father, women having an inferior conception of their body and finding it more difficult to achieve an identity, personality being formed by the age of five and changing a little after that. So do you have the rest of the day? Because let's talk about criticisms of psychoanalysis. No, it really won't take that long. The first one is that Freud's unsystematic and uncontrolled data collection was a problem. Basically, the data was what Freud could remember about what his patients said, which may or may not have been reinterpreted to support his views. So that's the only information we have. Freud may have inferred stories of childhood seduction because there's no evidence that any patient ever told Freud that she had been seduced by her father. Freud's research was unrepresentative of the population. It was a sample of him and ed the educated, wealthy Viennese who were his patients. Now, this is an external validity issue, and you can't generalize from that sample to the general, general population or develop a theory of personality based solely on neurotics. A fourth point is that Freud's notes from therapy sessions don't match published case histories. This is a real problem. Furthermore, he only published six case histories after his split with Brewer, and none of them provide uh, compelling supportive evidence for psychoanalysis. What about his unpublished case histories? He destroyed those. Freud made limited attempts to verify his patients' accounts of their childhood experiences. 
And Freud's, a, a final criticism is that Freud's ideas about female psychosexual development were incorrect. They weren't just incorrect, they were incredibly incorrect. Well, let's not end on a down note. Let's talk about his contributions and uh, how culture views him. Well, the acceptance of psychoanalysis is based on an intuitive appearance of plausibility. Fraud, fraud whoops, that's a Freudian slip right there. Freud made many observations over many years, and his system has an internal logic to it. Uh, interest in Freud's ideas remains high, but few people are actually in psychoanalytic therapy. Basically, long-term Freudian therapy has been superseded by briefer and less expensive behavioral and cognitive therapies. The development of drug regimens has also reduced the need for psychotherapy um, for a number of mental disorders. Here's an odd tidbit. MGM offered Freud $100,000 to collaborate on a film about love, but he didn't take them up on that. The public enthusiasm for Freud has distorted some of his ideas. For example, Freud never argued for weakening sexual codes of conduct or for increased sexual freedom. He actually thought that inhibiting the sex drive kept civilization functioning. Let's end on a positive note though. And this is it. Freud remains the most cited individual in psychological research. And that would make him feel vindicated as a scientist. Well, that's chapter 13. And thanks for listening.